You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Waiting on a tax return? Hopefully it ends up in your hands. Fraudulent tax returns due to identity theft increased by 30% in 2023. If you're in a bind this tax season, LifeLock can help. Our U.S.-based restoration specialists are experts dedicated to helping solve your identity theft issues. And all LifeLock plans are backed by the Million Dollar Protection Package. So we'll reimburse you up to the limits of your plan if you lose money due to identity theft. Help protect your information this tax season with LifeLock. Save up to 25% your first year at LifeLock.com slash aware. Hey there, I'm Dylan Lewis, one of the hosts of Motley Fool Money. Each weekday on Motley Fool Money, we talk through the business news you need to know and the stories moving stocks on Wall Street. On weekends, we dive into the industries shaping tomorrow and host the experts, authors, and executives that understand them. Tune in for insights, a long-term perspective on investing, and of course, stock ideas, plenty of them. To quote a listener, it pays to listen. Check us out and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, episode 172, The Invasion of Norway, Allied Reactions. This week, a big thank you goes out to Stuart for the donations and to Ryan for choosing to support the podcast by becoming a member. You can find out more over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. The Germans would have the initiative in the Norwegian campaign, and they would catch the Norwegians and the Western Allied powers off guard with their actions, but that did not mean that there was not a reaction from the British and French in the opening days of the invasion. The first reaction to the German invasion was by the Royal Navy, and on both April's 8th and 9th, there would be naval actions in the North Sea, with the events on April 8th resulting in the sinking of the British destroyer HMS Glowworm. There would be the possibility of a much greater naval battle on April 9th, as the Royal Navy reacted to the large German fleet presence in the North Sea. While the Royal Navy was attempting to prevent the Germans from doing whatever it was they were trying to do, it didn't really matter, in London and Paris, the first days of the invasion would be ones of confusion, as the leaders of the two governments tried to determine what exactly was happening in Norway, and then tried to determine how they should react. The first action that the British forces would take to meet the German invasion was dispatching the Royal Navy into the North Sea. This move was not done specifically to prevent an invasion of Norway, but, or even really to react to it but instead was simply what the Royal Navy did any time major German naval vessels did anything. In this case, there were confirmed reports of multiple German naval formations coming out of the ports in Germany, and so the British home fleet was dispatched to try and intercept them, under the theory that they were probably trying to make their way into the Atlantic to attack British shipping. These forces, built around several battleships, would be making their way north when the reports of the glowworm came in. These were the reports that we discussed back in episode 166. At that time, the battle cruiser Repulse and the cruiser Penelope and four destroyers were sent on ahead of the slower British battleships in an attempt to intercept the German ships that had attacked the glowworm. Over the next several hours, the ships of the Royal Navy would proceed to miss every single opportunity to intercept the various German task forces that were escorting the invasion forces to areas in western Norway. They would be sailing northwest away from Trondheim when Task Force 2 moved against the Norwegian port, while the cruisers that were sent to patrol the Norwegian coast between Stavanger and Bergen were positioned too far off the coast, allowing the German ships of Task Force 3 to move on Bergen unmolested. After missing these opportunities, early on the morning of April 9th, news would arrive that the Germans had attacked Oslo, Trondheim, Bergen, and Stavanger, and this left Admiral Forbes in an interesting spot aboard his flagship of the home fleet. His largest concentration of ships was still trying to intercept the large German surface ships that had attacked the Glowworm. These were the German battleships Gneisenau and Scharnhorst. But what was becoming clear is that they were just distractions from the real German efforts to get troops ashore. But he also had to contend with multiple incomplete and at times wildly inaccurate intelligence reports about German fleet movements. Piecing together all of the intelligence reports, which did contain solid information about all the various areas that the German fleet was attacking, although their force estimates were often incorrect, the best course of action for the home fleet seemed to be a quick strike against Bergen. A few different facts made this seem like the best option. The first simply being that the fleet was relatively close to Bergen, and then there were reports that there were only cruisers and destroyers at the Norwegian port with the two German battleships now being reported to be at Narvik and Trondheim. 
Just after 6 a.m. on the morning of the 9th, conversations between Admiral Forbes, the commander of the Home Fleet, and the Admiralty back in London would begin, with the Home Fleet just 90 miles from Bergen. Forbes suggested an attack on the German forces near the city, and sent out orders to some of the cruiser and destroyer formations that had been dispatched for patrols to join back up with the main body of the fleet to prepare for the action. The Admiralty evaluated the idea and then gave its approval, with secondary approval also arriving for the cancellation of a possible cruiser operation against Trondheim, which had been the previously sort of suggested option. The focus on a single objective was felt to be required because the German battleships were still not 100% accounted for. There had been some reports of their position, but it was felt that isolated groups of cruisers would be too vulnerable to possible interception by those battleships, while the rest of the home fleet was in action against a Bergen, so they were called to join with the battleships. It would take some time before the attack could be launched, though. The ships were close to the target, but with the need to concentrate the fleet and the relatively slow speed of advance, that you know, it was likely that the attack wouldn't occur until after nightfall. The slow speed was actually, in this case, not caused by the old battleships, which would be a problem for the Royal Navy for basically the entire war, but instead the destroyers. Due to the weather, the seas were very heavy, and this forced the destroyers down to a maximum speed of just 16 knots because they were trying to avoid possible damage. Their battle speed would have been faster, but when it came to cruising, 16 knots is all they could do. As the home fleet was moving to Bergen, new reports based on aerial reconnaissance arrived that there were two German heavy cruisers in the port. These reports caused some concern among the leadership back at the Admiralty. They were concerned that in the restricted waters leading up to Bergen, these cruisers would cause a lot of problems for the British attack plan, which involved destroyers moving into the harbor and to make the attacks, with larger ships sort of staying out in more open waters. This amplified already existing concerns about the state of the coastal defenses around Bergen, which might have been remanned by German gun crews. I think that the situation with the shore batteries is an interesting area of comparison between the decision-making on the German and British sides. Both sides knew that there were Norwegian shore batteries in place to protect the approaches to cities like Bergen, but they made two different choices around how to react to this information. On the German side, they hoped that the speed of their action would reduce the damage that was caused by shore installations, believing that it was worth sustaining some damage to make their attack. On the British side, when concerns of the shore batteries were added to other information, they decided to pull back and cancel their planned attack, even though their naval forces were drastically more powerful than anything that the Germans had available. And honestly, the, the loss of a few destroyers was not going to be crippling to the Royal Navy. This risk-averse decision-making would, in many instances, be the hallmark of Allied decisions in the early years of the war. But on the afternoon of April 9th, the most important decision was made not by Admiral Forbes, who was with the fleet, but instead back in London, when the Admiralty cancelled the Bergen operation, as the destroyers of the fleet were approaching the start of their attack. Churchill, who was first Lord of the Admiralty at this point in time, would later write that, quote, Looking back on this affair, I consider that the Admiralty kept too close control upon the Commander-in-Chief, and after learning his original intention to force the passage into Bergen, we should have confined ourselves to sending him information, end quote. So instead of a bold thrust into Bergen, the fleet would instead just patrol offshore. If they had attacked Bergen, what they would have found, instead of two German cruisers ready to fight, was one heavily damaged cruiser, one damaged support ship, and four motor torpedo boats. Not exactly strong opposition. While the home fleet was moving about the North Sea, the Luftwaffe was keeping tabs on its movements when possible. The weather hampered air operations at various points throughout the day, but the Germans were still able to keep touch with the home fleet, and in the middle of the afternoon, they were able to take advantage of that information to launch an air attack. The attacking forces would be comprised of 47 Ju-88s flying up from Westerland in Germany, and 41 HE-111s that were being based out of the captured Norwegian airfield at Sola. The German aircraft would begin their attack on the group of ships that had been dispatched to move into Bergen before the British had cancelled that action, before turning their focus towards the larger capital ships. The first attacks would be on the force of cruisers and destroyers near Bergen, with only minor damage to the cruisers in attendance. However, the destroyer HMS Gurkha would be the target for focused German attacks after it moved away slightly from the other ships. The Gurkha would eventually sink due to the damage that it would sustain, with the loss of 16 British sailors. 
After the attack on the cruisers and destroyers, the German aircraft would shift their focus to the larger grouping of British ships, including the two battleships. Once again, the damage was minimal, with some near misses causing some very minor damage. There was, however, one very lucky break, and that was when a 500-kilogram bomb hit the Rodney. Fortunately for all those aboard, the bomb did not explode when it hit the battleship's armored deck. After the attack was complete, Admiral Forbes would take his fleet north and west, away from the Norwegian coast, only turning east again after his collection of ships was joined by the battleship Warspite and the aircraft carrier Furious. The fleet would then move into position for the Furious to launch an air attack against Trondheim on the morning of the 10th, before Forbes made the decision to move the entire collection of ships north. The primary reason for this decision was due to concerns about further German air attacks, with it being known to the British that the Germans had captured several Norwegian airfields that could be used to launch further air attacks on any Royal Navy ships within range. But moving north, Forbes hoped to reduce this danger by pushing out the range, especially from airfields in northern Germany and southern Norway. While Forbes and the home fleet had been oscillating between pursuing action and caution off the coast of central and southern Norway, near Narvik, British ships had been perfectly positioned to prevent the German invasion of Narvik but would find themselves out of position at the critical moment. These British ships were the eight destroyers that had been near the entrances to Narvik in Vestfjord. The destroyers had been guarding the entrances to the fort for 48 hours when an order arrived from the Admiralty that they should forfeit their position and instead join the forces of Admiral Whitworth, who was further off the coast. This order arrived on the morning of April 8th, and about 15 hours later, 10 German destroyers on their way to Narvik would move through the exact area that the Royal Navy destroyers would have been in if they had not moved. The orders that had been given were rooted in the concerns that the British destroyers might be attacked by some of the larger German ships that were known to be operating off the Norwegian coast during this time. Whitworth was in command of the battlecruiser squadron and had the renown and repulse at his disposal along with the cruiser Penelope and several additional destroyers. Adding the Narvik destroyers to his command gave him even greater strength, but also provided the destroyers with the protection of the much larger guns of the battlecruisers. Whitworth would take his command even further away from Norway over the course of the 8th, under the belief that the Germans would be sailing even further north, and so he had to get in position to meet them. Just before 7 p.m. on the 8th, another order would arrive from the Admiralty, making it clear that Whitworth should endeavor to prevent the Germans from moving into Narvik, with the order stating, quote, to Vice Admiral Commanding Battlecruisers, repeat to Commander-in-Chief. Most immediate. The force under your orders is to concentrate on preventing any German force proceeding to Narvik. May enter territorial waters as necessary. End quote. Even with this order, Whitworth did not immediately change course, and in fact he would continue on his previous course, to the west and away from Narvik, until midnight, over five hours after the order was received. This additional distance from Narvik became an even greater problem over the night of 8th and into the 9th due to the high winds that the British would experience, and which would be felt by many other ships in the North Sea on that night. These winds caused seas that were almost too much for the British destroyers, and the entire British squadron was forced to pay far more attention to simply keeping their ships on the surface of the sea than making good time towards Narvik. It would really only be at about 2.40 a.m. that the seas died down and Whitworth was able to move his ships towards Narvik at any real speed. While they were on their way back to Narvik, the British ships would essentially just stumble into some Germans. These were the ships commanded by Admiral Lutgens, the battleships Gneisenau and Scharnhorst. Lutgens had been dispatched into the North Sea not to engage Royal Navy ships, but instead to act as a diversion with the hope that any news of the German battleships would cause the British to dedicate some of the Royal Navy's ships to hunting them down. With these orders in mind, the German battleships would discover the British ships around 4 a.m., with the British also discovering the presence of the German ships at roughly the same time. Whitworth would close on the German ships until the range was about 17,000 yards, and then the renowned opened fire at 4.08 a.m., the firing from both sides would not prove to be very accurate at this long range, partially due to the continued heavy seas, but also due to snow squalls that were kind of moving through the area at the time, which of course did not do anything good to visibility. Between the first shot and when Lutgens ordered the German ships to turn away from the British, only three German shells would hit the Renown, none of which caused any serious damage. The same number of shells from the Renown would hit the Gneisenau, 
with the larger 15-inch British shells causing a bit more damage. Particularly, one of the shells would destroy the front fire control systems, and that would put the guns of the Gnais now out of action for a brief period. After losing sight of the German capital ships, Whitworth continued on his way back to Narvik, and would eventually place his ships in a position to prevent any movement of German ships in and out of Narvik, which was good, uh, but also about 12 hours too late to prevent the most important ships from entering into Narvik, the 10 destroyers that had been transporting the ground troops that had landed in the Norwegian city. Whitworth, being in this position, would set the stage for the First Battle of Narvik, which we discussed last episode, doing a bit of a time shift here. There has been criticisms leveled against Lutkins for not continuing his attack on the British ships, but in his mind, he was fulfilling his core mission, not of getting into a knockdown drag out fight with the Royal Navy, but simply continuing to exist and hopefully pulling Royal Navy resources away from the landings. And in this, he was successful. The fear of the Gneisenau and Scharnhorst would greatly change the actions of the Royal Navy during the Norwegian campaign, especially in these opening days. So Lutkins, even though he'd only landed three shells uh, on the Renown, had served his purpose, had completed his mission. You've worked hard for what you have. Your money, your assets, your 401k, and home. Isn't it all worth protecting? Nearly one in four consumers have been a victim of identity theft. LifeLock Ultimate Plus helps protect your finances with up to $3 million in reimbursement. LifeLock alerts you to identity threats you might miss. And if your identity is stolen, your dedicated U.S.-based restoration specialist will work to fix it. Let LifeLock help protect what you've worked so hard for. Save 25% off your first year on LifeLock Ultimate Plus at LifeLock.com slash aware. Terms apply. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire enslaved Frederick Douglass, risking his life for liberty, and about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today, and join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode, where I'd like to tell you a story. While the ships of the Royal Navy were active in the North Sea, back in London and Paris, the atmosphere on April 9th could best be described with the word confusion. During the early morning hours, the information available to the British government was fragmentary, and also at times contradictory. To try and sort through the available data, the Chiefs of Staff Committee would gather together at 6 a.m. London time for discussions in advance of a meeting of the full British War Cabinet at 8.30. There would be multiple meetings of both groups throughout the day, and while the exact topics of discussions would change, the common theme was that the British were almost entirely reactive to what the Germans were doing. Throughout the early days of the invasion, the British would develop plans or ideas based on the incomplete information that they had available. But then, before that plan could be put into action, other information would arrive that made that plan a risky or totally unworkable solution. This gives the British actions during this time on one level a feeling of inaction, but on another level a feeling of something approaching panic as operational plans were created and destroyed in the time it takes to, I don't know, drink a single cup of tea. There were a few major assumptions that were made by the British which would be the basis for their various plans throughout the day. The first was that the Royal Navy would be able to exercise almost complete control over the seas on the approaches to Norway. This meant that, at least theoretically, the British could land troops anywhere because the ships were available to get those troops anywhere safely. At the same time, the British remained very focused on Narvik, very focused on the access to the Swedish iron ore, even though the German operation was now focused on the entirety of Norway. 
The reason that both of these assumptions would be important and would be so directly attacked by the British actions was due to the fact that German control of particularly central Norway completely changed the situation in the North Sea and in Narvik. Airfields in central Norway would allow the German aircraft the range to attack British ships on their way to Narvik, an ability that would be on full display when Forbes' ships were attacked when they were near Bergen, which we discussed a few paragraphs ago. The presence of strong German air groups in Norway also made it much more challenging for the Royal Navy to achieve any kind of surprise landing. And as the Second World War would show, there's a large difference in the difficulty between an unopposed and a strongly opposed amphibious landing. The facts of German air power and their actions to seize airfields and their first mover advantage would be known by the time that the Supreme War Council met at 5.30 p.m. on the 9th. The council, being the top-level collaborative body between the British and French, had important decisions to make around how to react to the German actions. There were two different basic ideas discussed at the council. The first, and championed by the French, was that Allied efforts should focus on retaking and controlling Narvik. It had already been identified as an important objective, and it was now in German hands. And controlling that port would still prevent the movement of the iron ore, which was still good. The second idea was pushed for by the British, and it involved attacks against Trondheim and Bergen in central Norway. These attacks would, according to British planners, make it easier to isolate Narvik while also helping the Norwegians both in morale and in the physical presence of British and French troops to help remove the German invaders from central Norway, and maybe prepare to defend against the possibility of German troops moving up from the south, which was almost certainly their plan. The council would not be able to agree on a unified theory of action, and instead there would be several operations launched to land troops in multiple different areas in Norway. The two main areas of focus over the following days would be Narvik and Trondheim, with planning and preparations for landings in both of these areas. We will spend quite a bit of time in the coming episodes discussing the landings at Narvik, so for right now let's focus on the planning and actions around the landings at Trondheim. One of the primary reasons that the landing at Trondheim had any chance of happening was because Churchill wanted it to happen. As soon as the invasion had started, Churchill had ordered that all of the information that was coming in from Norway be forwarded directly to him immediately, which gave him an advantage in many of the conversations with other leaders, because he would have more information than they had. However, this kind of idea about an operation against Trondheim was not some kind of rogue and somewhat silly Churchillian idea, something that he would be famous for. And it did enjoy wide support from others, including the British and French ambassadors in Sweden, which would be in close contact with the Norwegian government throughout the invasion, even meeting with them near the border on April 12th. The concern of the ambassadors and the Norwegian government was that they wanted assistance in actually resisting the German invasion. British and French troops at Narvik provided basically no assistance to the Norwegians, as they were trying to prevent the Germans from taking over their country. It was just too far north, it was too isolated. Trondheim was very different because it was further south, and closer to the areas that the Germans were already in control of. This fact was expressed in multiple communications in the days that followed the invasion, with the French ambassador to Sweden writing on April 13th that, quote, The Allied mission here, and also the Swedes, are unanimous in their opinion that the most effective Allied help would be to recapture Trondheim. At close to the same time, the British ambassador to the Norwegian government would write, quote, I venture to urge that military assistance at Trondheim is first necessity. Seizure of Narvik was of little assistance to Norwegian government, end quote. Eventually, Churchill and the others that supported operations against Trondheim would have their way. However, Chamberlain and others still pushed for operations against Narvik, which would split the focus of the Allies in the days that followed. The basic concept of the operations against Trondheim, which would be codenamed Operation Hammer, was for two landings to occur, one to the north and one to the south of the city. The landings in the north would take place at Namsos, and in the south they would take place at Andalsnes, with another force being landed closer to Trondheim at Vejarnes. Now, I don't expect you to know the Norwegian geography of the exact position of these relatively small port cities, but the distance between Andalsnes and Namsos is around 300 kilometers as the crow flies. The actual travel distance for men trying to move from those areas to Trondheim was much longer due to the nature of Norway. 
and for the troops landing at, for example, Andalsnes, they would have to walk almost 300 kilometers due to the geography, which would force them to take a long detour inland. Oh, and it was still April. There was a lot of snow on the ground. There were also, of course, some German troops that would not be too thrilled to learn of British and French landings. Just traversing the terrain with all the snow would have been a major problem for the battalions of British territorial troops that would have been involved. That they didn't even have the proper gear, they didn't have the proper experience in these conditions or in this terrain, let alone also the experience of fighting Germans at the same time. And so it's probably good that the operation was cancelled before it was put into action. It would instead be filed away as yet another Allied plan that was out of touch with what could actually be accomplished with the forces that were available. However, the fact that it was doomed to failure on the ground was not the primary cause for its cancellation. Instead, the major voices against the operation were the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force. The Royal Navy was concerned about the vulnerability to air attack for any ship that moved close to central Norway in the days that followed the invasion. At the same time, the Royal Air Force was resistant to any diversion of air resources away from Britain and France. This resistance to providing any real air strength for operations in Norway would be a problem for the entire duration of resistance to the German invasion. It essentially gave the Germans complete control of the air over central and southern Norway, allowing them to use their air power on both land and at sea to great effect. While the British were planning and then cancelling ideas for large operations, the Germans were already moving into the Norwegian interior, and the British were executing smaller operations at various areas around Norway, all of which we will discuss next episode.